Greetings, my name is Dr. Magoha, and today we'll be discussing traumatic spinal cord injury. A traumatic spinal cord injury is a traumatic insult to the spinal cord that results in a change in the cord's normal motor, sensory, or autonomic function, which can be temporary or permanent. The level of function is the lowest level of normal motor and sensory function. It is further subdivided into complete spinal cord injury and incomplete spinal cord injury. Complete spinal cord injury. A complete spinal cord injury is defined as having no motor or sensory function, more than three levels below the level of injury and affecting both sides of the body equally. There is also a complete loss of bladder and sexual function. It is usually caused by a contusion or ischemia rather than a transection of the cord. Only 3% of patients with complete injuries at the time of presentation will recover within 24 hours. If the injury is complete after 24 hours, it is complete and permanent. Incomplete spinal cord injury. Any patient with residual motor or sensory function more than three levels below the injury has an incomplete spinal cord injury. With sparing of lower extremity sensation, sparing of sacral sensation, or sphincter tone. This should be distinguished from neurogenic shock, which is defined as the temporary loss of all neurologic function below the level of injury, including the loss of all reflexes, including the balbocavernosus reflex. If the lesion is located above the sixth thoracic vertebrae, the patient may experience spinal shock which occurs when sympathetic innervation of the vasculature is lost, resulting in unopposed parasympathetic activity and loss of vascular tone, muscle tone, and venous pooling. Some patients with spinal shock have sacral sparing, which indicates that the lesion is incomplete. The persistence of the following functions indicates sacral sparing. Number one, function of the great toe, which is assigned to S1, perianal sensation, which is S2, S3, and S4, and the balbocavernosus reflex, which is also S2, S3, and S4. The balbocavernosus reflex is the first to return after spinal shock wears off, usually within 24 to 72 hours. The presence of the bulbocavernosus reflex in the acute setting with neurologic deficit is a poor prognostic indicator because it indicates that the patient is not in spinal shock, implying that the deficit is a real injury that cannot be attributed to spinal shock. The absence of the bulbocavernosus reflex in the acute setting indicates spinal shock and is an excellent prognostic indicator. It indicates that the patient's exam was caused by spinal shock and there is a chance of recovery. Now let's talk about a few of the incomplete spinal cord patterns. The first is central cord syndrome. This is caused by flexion and extension which is frequently accompanied by superimposed cervical stenosis. Because of the vascular watershed zone, this causes injury to the central gray matter of the cord. Physical compression from an injury may cause transient ischemia or edema, eventually causing damage to the central portion of the cord. The examination reveals motor weakness in the upper limbs which is more than in the lower extremities, as well as sensory weakness in the hands and arms. Allodynia and paresthesias in affected extremities are also common. Symptom disparity between upper and lower extremities is due to the arrangement of laminated fibers 
in the corticospinal tract and dorsal columns that affect the medial fibers. These are both cervical and thoracic, more than in the peripheral fibers, which are mostly lumbar and sacral. Regarding treatment, many surgeons prefer to postpone surgery if there is no instability or no continued cord compression. This is because most people will only make a partial recovery from central cord syndrome. Anterior cord syndrome. This is a usually vascular in origin in the distribution of the artery of Adam Kiewitz and affects the motor and sensory pathways in the anterior cord. This occurs occasionally with repair of thoracic, aortic aneurysms. Symptoms typically appear in the vascular watershed areas surrounding the fifth thoracic vertebrae with complete loss of motor function and pain and temperature sensation with sparing of vibratory sense due to sparing of the posterior columns. Brown Sequard Syndrome. This is due to injury to one side of the spinal cord, often due to an extraaxial tumor causing spinal cord compression, or due to penetrative spinal cord injury. This injury results in ipsilateral hemiplegia and loss of proprioception. A few segments below the level of the lesion, there is contralateral loss of pain and temperature due to cord hemisection. Now, let's go on to emergency management. Start with the airway, breathing, cervical spine, and circulatory control. Order the activity as flat bed rest in reverse Trendelberg position. This is to help with breathing and pulmonary status. And remember, log roll precautions on a spine board. Next, get a focus history and neurologic exam. Assess the mechanism of injury, weakness, paresthesias, all following the trauma. Then, palpate the spine looking for step-offs, points of tenderness, and widening of spinous processes. Then do a comprehensive motor level assessment assessing both skeletal muscle and do not forget the rectal exam. Then we move on to sensory assessment to find the sensory level. Do pinpricked, light touch, proprioception and joint position sense. Then next go on to reflex assessment. Check for muscle stretch reflexes and do not forget the bulbocavernosus reflex. Then lastly, assess for autonomic dysfunction. Look for altered patterns of perspiration, bowel or bladder incontinence, and any history of priapism. We then proceed to the radiographic evaluation. If you suspect bony injury, request a CT scan. If the patient exhibits any neurologic symptoms, an MRI should be asked for. Remember to include up to three levels below your suspected sensory level. Methylprednisolone is controversial in the treatment of acute spinal cord injury. However, if there are no penetrating injuries and the patient presents within eight hours of the injury, methylprednisolone can be given at 30 milligrams per kg IV over the first 15 minutes, then at 5.4 milligrams per kg IV over the next 23 hours. To detect cardiovascular dysfunction and respiratory insufficiency, use cardiac, hemodynamic, and respiratory monitoring devices. Remember that aspiration and shock are the leading causes of death in spinal cord injury. Correct hypertension 
in spinal cord injury with the goal of having more than 90 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure. Maintain, maintenance of the mean arterial blood pressure above 85 to 90 mm per Hg for the first 5 to 7 days following injury is recommended after cervical spinal cord injury. High cervical spinal cord injury may compromise respiration due to paralyzed intercostal muscles or the diaphragm as sensation originates from C3 to C5. The patient may need intubation and or diaphragm pacing. Put in a nasogastric or orogastric tube to prevent vomiting and aspiration because paralytic alias is common in spinal cord injury. To prevent bladder distension, a Foley catheter is used to decompress the bladder a spinal cord injury may cause urinary retention. Monitor the patient's temperature as vasomotor paralysis may produce loss of temperature control. Monitor electrolytes as hypovolemia and hypotension may cause hypokalemia. Prophylactic treatment of venous thromboembolism is recommended within 72 hours of injury if there are no contraindications. Use low molecular weight heparins or fixed low dose unfractionated heparin, rota rotating beds, and pneumatic compression stockings if available. Initiate enteral nutrition as soon as possible. Early nutrition within 72 hours improves neurologic outcomes decreases length of stay, and decreases complication risk. Indirect calorimetry is the best means to determine caloric needs of a spinal cord injury patient. Lastly, we move on to prognosis and sequelae. Number one, you need to use a functional independence measure. This is an indicator of the burden of care in spinal cord injury. Number two, enter an Asia grade. This includes things like sacral sensation, ankle spasticity, urethral and rectal sphincter function, and abductor hallucis motor function. All of these can be used to predict neurologic function and outcome of the patient. If it is an incomplete neurologic injury, surgical reduction is urgent, therefore plan accordingly. If it is complete injury, then surgery is less emergent. Thank you for your attention and have a blessed day.